On today's episode of Mile Higher, we're going to be focusing on a series of events that took place in 1996 in a city called Virginia, Brazil. The 1996 Virginia UFO incident, what do you think? The most well-kept secret in the military circles of Brazil. Three young girls in this story who get within eight feet of this being. And it seems like the majority of people who live there believe them as well. I wouldn't call myself like a skeptic on this kind of stuff. I do 110% believe that aliens exist. Classified Brazilian Air Force documents contain several UFOs witnessed by both civilians and military personnel. You are forever looked at differently. And it's not like you can just forget what you've seen. Why is the U.S. Air Force confiscating the bodies in Brazil? All four of us can sit here and say we 100% are confident that there are aliens out there. They think people are going to believe that? Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 254. And today is Alien Day. We are here to talk about Brazil's Roswell. It's actually a really fascinating story. It is the most fascinating story I've come across <laughs> the in most. ufology in a very, very long time. It is since quite um, the real Roswell, pretty much. This is probably one of the most compelling stories involving a ufo crashing but also these beings that were likely piloting this craft being recovered yes and, and who seen. were they recovered by united states baby <laughs> you know that eventually initially they were captured by brazilian authorities mm -hmm. but yes it is very weird that the united states flew their ass down there and got them yep which i have a i have an interesting theory about that by the way that not bring shocking in. No, of course, the United States is always trying to be at the forefront of the, the mm -hmm. UFO conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, Area 51, we all remember that. Remember those people storming Area 51? I wish we would have done that. You wish we went down there and yeah, tried it out? I don't know. What the hell? What mm. else are we going to do? That's true. We have nothing better to do. Could have been like a mile higher like, expedition. Meet up? Yeah. Meet up at <laughs> <No>. Area 51? <laughs> Storm it together? <laughs> no, I meant like, you oh, know, I know what you're like talking about. Events. That big one where people were going to all storm yeah, it together. Yeah, where they were Naruto okay. running. I forgot, <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. Didn't yep. everyone that did that, didn't they all get put on like a watch list or something? Yes. Did yeah. they? Okay. Yeah, everybody got in trouble for doing that. You can't just do that. That's iconic. Yeah, there's like clips of people like walking across the, you know, there's like a a, a gate area or an opening where there's like the little drop down rails mm -hmm. that come down and people are like walking into it. And it's like, what are you doing? You're stupid. They're going to, they're going to come arrest they you. Get your ass. And they can shoot you if they want. It's like it yeah. literally posted signs. You will mm -hmm. be shot. Mm -hmm. They don't give a damn. Why do you have a Sharpie? You're going to draw us up. I'm going to sketch diagram? the alien for you that they saw. Oh, okay. Cause I saw it too. In my that. dreams last night. Mm. Did you? Yes. I was visited. Mm. We had fun. What'd so, you do? Like, David Huggins fun or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it was quite as fun as David Huggins had with the, his uh, his alien girlfriend but David Huggins isn't the only one who claims to have slept with an alien either no there's a man in China as well mm -hmm. see this is what yeah, this is what's that. interesting to me about the whole alien conversation and it's such a shame that there's you know so many people you bring up aliens with them and they look at you like you're nuts even still and Which they're the ones that are nuts <laughs> and they don't understand well, I, I think expansion of the universe. Well, I think it's just they don't understand these stories, and like these stories are starting to mm -hmm. to be made into documentaries, especially in recent years. And so, more and more people are getting exposed to the facts surrounding these incidents that have happened throughout history. I mean, since Roswell happened in the United States, nineteen forty seven, all the way up into present day, the amount of contact events with unknown spaceships or ufos and potentially alien beings is actually pretty high there's it's a pretty high number of different incidents where not only were ufos observed or ufos landed but then beings were also seen i mean we just not that long ago we covered the uh, aerial school i incident. believe air aerial school they for saw sure. beings there for sure i mean there was a massive amount of witnesses to that and so today's event is very similar to that. Mm -hmm. well, Although that's, there's that's more hard. evidence for this one. Yes, there is more evidence here. And we'll have to kind of 
decide what we think. All of you need to make up your minds on this one. But that's what's so hard is there are so many incidents. They can't all have actually happened. And there's so many bullshitters out there that I just I but get there's very skeptical. About the more I've learned, the though. more skeptical I am. Not to the existence of aliens. I believe aliens exist 1,000%. But these stories, I struggle. I struggle. Although this one today is uh, very compelling. Well, I think it's hard because we've all of our minds have been sort of poisoned by the media and movies and things like that. So there's always that question of like, are we, you know, creating these stories as a result of the things that we've seen before in movies and books and things like that? Or are these clout. general encounters? There's just so many fakers out there doing it for attention. It's just hard to. But there's fakers in every subject of the world pretty much doing True. things for clout as well. True. So this isn't really no different. But I think the ramifications, if you are looking at this from a higher view, you start realizing like, wow, if if aliens really are here and they are, you know, crashing their ships from time to time and being recovered, that's that's the biggest news to ever break in human history. Mm -hmm. But it's taken so lightly because People are like, there's no proof. Where's the video? Where's the, you know, the photos and things like that. But but can you blame people? It's hard to to weed out what's true and what's not with so much. Do I need bullshit. to go back to is seeing believing, or can you believe without seeing? I don't. I don't. Do I know. need to revisit this discussion that we had? I think on a few episodes. I don't know what ago. the answer is there. I I find it hard to believe. Can things, things that be I true see? without physical proof? Of course Does, they can. But it's harder for you to believe without the physical proof it's harder but i can depending on especially when there are multiple people a lot of people who have witnessed something yeah there's three young girls in this story mm -hmm. who get within eight feet of this being eight feet but still that's, that's like three girls me to three you three girls it's just three yeah and then a Aerial bunch of school was a lot easier for me to believe all these children together but i do the younger they are the, yeah like, the but more that's innocent the Mm, but also the, I feel That's like true. more the storytelling. Yeah. And also they're just susceptible to being like manipulated into if one kid is like, oh, remember this right. happened? Mm -hmm. Then it's mm -hmm. like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, I remember that yeah. happened. But it wasn't just these three. Girls. No, there's, there's a number of other witnesses, mm -hmm. military, high ranking officials. Yes. I mean, this is a. Yeah, this is either the greatest cover up ever, ever done by an entire town in Brazil mm -hmm. Or the greatest joint bullshit. Yeah, the greatest joint bullshit. Or it is the the most amazing, compelling UFO story mm -hmm. to ever come out. No, it's true. And it's true. I just want to give a shout out to uh, Mr. Fox, James Fox. James He's the Fox. director behind the documentary that recently came out called Moment of Contact. Very, very well done. Really, really interesting. It is. The fact that he went, he goes down to Brazil and interviews all of these people that witnessed the event firsthand, yeah, including the guy that literally was at the crash site where this yeah. where this saucer like craft went down. There were some very compelling interviews in that. I mean, these people seem very shaken up and don't seem like they'd have a reason to make this up. Plus, there's so much right. crossover between their stories. Um, he did interview someone from the military. That interview was very interesting to me. And and I think it's always hard with the military witnesses because they're coming forward, but they have to kind of do it anonymously because they're potentially life's at risk if they come out publicly. I mean, we all saw what happened with Bob Lazar and whether or not you believe Bob Lazar's story, I believe whether he, he worked at Area 51 or Los Alamos. And so there's always like skepticism around that. But I think you have to take these military um, whistleblowers seriously mm -hmm. because what's what especially when they're coming forward and they're hiding their face they don't want their identity revealed what is the point of coming forth and just straight up lying at that point mm -hmm. if, if you don't have legitimate information to tell and your your name's not attached to it right so there's not, no element of fame not making money know? right there's really no point to it so it's like mm -hmm. i i find a lot of credibility with those individuals I do too. who aren't seeking praise and approval and that's where people are like well bob lazar you know he had an interesting story, but he also went public, showed his face, and went all over the place. He's kind of a UFO celebrity now. 
So some people would be skeptical. He's so not the that. type to want that. But that's that, the thing. Yeah. You know? If you really know who he is and, mm -hmm. you know, listen to him speak, you're like, mm, I don't know about that. Well, let's let's jump in today. Yeah. We have I'm a lot very to go over. This. So today's episode, we're going to be focusing on a series of events that took place in 1996. And these events took place in a city called Virginia, Brazil. Also, there are a lot of Portuguese pronunciations in here. So please bear with us. We're going to try our best. So the city of Virginia is located in Minas Gerais, which is a state in southern Brazil, and the area is known for its coffee plantations. In 1996, Virginia was a medium-sized city about the size of Boulder, Colorado, with a population of 120,000 people. Minus the weed. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yes, in Boulder. Correct. They don't have weed there? I'm sure they no, have yeah. weed. No. Well, they have it. Is yeah. it legal is the question. No. Definitely oh, right. highly doubt it. Not legal? No, definitely not. Definitely Damn. way less Subarus. <laughs> That's a good thing. That, the, oh. the amount of Subarus you see in Boulder, no, Colorado literally. is it's wild. Is All right, rain it in a here. A phenomenon, honestly. <laughs> rain it in. It's the phenomenon. It is the phenomenon. Oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so it was and still is a predominantly Catholic area and it's a major center of coffee production and export in Brazil. And fun fact, Brazil actually produces about a third of the world's coffee. That's a, a third ton, honestly. That is. Wow. Yeah. They got mm. hella Starbucks. Just kidding. Mm, probably no Starbucks. <laughs> no. Starbucks sucks. But Virginia is most famous for a series of strange incidents that began in 1996. And we're going to be taking a look at how those events unfolded today, starting with the beginning of the year. So starting in January of 1996, NORAD, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, warned authorities in Brazil that their radar had picked up UFO activity near Virginia, Brazil. Which fun fact, NORAD is actually right here in Colorado, Colorado Springs and Cheyenne Mountain. Such a fun fact. Thank you. Very cool. Love that. On January 13th, 1996, the U.S. Air Force shot down an unidentified flying object. This UFO crashed about six miles away from Virginia. It's been reported that the Brazilian military in trucks, helicopters, and an army ambulance showed up at the site, and they allegedly collected the metallic debris left over. Early that morning, a pilot named Carlos de Souza was on his way from Sao Paulo to Minas Gerais to meet up with some friends to fly ultralight planes when he saw something odd in the night sky. He was driving down the freeway in the vicinity of Virginia when he spotted a UFO with smoke or some sort of mist surrounding it. The object looked like part of it had been torn off, and it appeared to be heading towards the highway, and it looked like it was moving about 300 to 400 meters from the ground. The craft was losing altitude until it became very close to the road, where it made a 360-degree turn. Then the craft started to gain altitude again. It was about 100 to 150 meters away from Carlos when its engines died completely. Then it started to go down. It looked like it didn't have enough lift to stay up in the air much longer. So Carlos watched as this UFO disappeared behind a hill in Maiolini Farm and hit the ground, and then a puff of smoke rose from the crash site. Now, Carlos thought whatever the strange aircraft was, there were probably people inside who needed help now. So he drove toward where he thought the UFO likely crashed. He raced up a dirt road, past two cattle gates, and toward a house and a hill. And finally, he found the UFO wreckage. It had crashed in a small pasture about 200 meters away from a small white house. Now, when Carlos exited his car, it smelled nasty. The air was sick. It smelled like ammonia and rotten eggs. It was so strong that his eyes began to water and he had to cover his face with his shirt. And the whole scene was not what Carlos was expecting. For one, the strong smell was just very odd to him. There was a big burnt circle in the grass, which we've talked about grass being burnt several times here on this show. And it was about 40 meters in diameter. And Carlos thought that the craft had left some sort of chemical burn. Around it, he could see that the UFO had crashed, rebounded, and the wreckage had spread out. The object was a little bigger than the size of a mini school bus, so Carlos knew that it was big enough to have beings inside. One of the debris pieces looked like it was covered in foil, the way that you would wrap up a chicken for roasting. So Carlos picked up the small piece of debris. It was very light, and he folded the piece together in his hands, sort of crumpling it. But when he released it, it went back to its original shape, 
So not at all like aluminum foil. When you crumple up aluminum foil, it stays that way. It doesn't immediately go back to a flat sheet when you, you know, open your hand up. Then within minutes, Carlos noticed some trucks driving down the road coming from the opposite direction he took to get to the crash site. They were trucks from the Brazilian military base. Now ASA or ESA stands for the following. Julia is going to say what it actually stands for. Escola de Sargentos das Armas. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, Which translates work. to School of Sergeants of Arms. It's basically a higher education military academy for non-commissioned officers. So these men show up, they get out of the trucks, and they begin shouting at Carlos, leave, leave, get out of here, scram. And they're shooing him away with their hands, telling him, you know, you better get out of here or else. Carlos was obviously confused, and he didn't immediately want to leave. He tried to talk to them, and he only got out no, but before they pulled out their guns. The army men started shooting at the ground in Carlos's direction as a warning. And they kept shouting, go away. I told you to leave. I'm ordering you to leave. The men pointed their guns directly at Carlos. And at this point, he was terrified. So he held up his hands and said, okay, okay. And with that, he got back into his car and hightailed it out of there. Carlos actually did give an interview to the press after the sighting. But after that, it seemed like he disappeared for nearly 26 years. So the date of this next incident we're going to talk about is not entirely clear, but it did happen sometime in January of 96, likely around the time that Carlos de Souza saw this UFO. A couple named Eurico and Oralina J. Freitas lived and worked on this farm. Now, the farm was located off BR-491 and access road to Virginia. Oralina was inside the house minding her business when she noticed that her cows outside had become very agitated and they were running around in circles around the house and making a lot of noise. And when Oralina looked outside, she noticed a mysterious object in the sky about five meters above the ground. So she called her husband over to take a look. And when Eureka looked outside, he saw an object the shape and size of a mini school bus in the sky. The object didn't make any noise. There was a lot of clear white smoke coming out of it and surrounding it. Eureka jokingly said, what is that? It looks like a submarine. It was long and cigar shaped and was moving at a high rate of speed. In fact, its speed made Eureka think that the object was in some sort of trouble. The couple watched the object float through the sky until it disappeared. Oralina stood very still and waited to see if she could hear the object fall, but she heard nothing. They claimed they were never approached by authorities about the incident, even though they reported it. January 20th, 1996 was a blustery, rainy day in Virginia. Around 3.30 p.m., three women were walking home. 16-year-old Liliane Silva and her 14-year-old sister Valkyria were traveling with their older friend, 21-year-old Katja and John J. Xavier. This was not the trio's usual way home. They were cutting through a vacant lot this time to make it home faster. This field was located near a gym in town. As they walked, the graffiti on the wall caught Liliane's eye. But that's when she noticed something terrifying crouched against the wall. It was a tiny brown alien being. The creature looked human-like, but it had oily skin, glowing red eyes, rubbery limbs, and three spikes on top of its head. And this creature smelled foul. It also looked like it was very feeble and suffering from the summer heat. Liliane let out a scream, and the girls turned to look. The alien heard the scream and turned to look back at the girls. Valkyria said she made eye contact with the creature and immediately felt it was very scared. She said that it was sort of an exchange of fear. Both she and the creature were afraid of a being that neither had seen before, and that was enough to scare Valkyria and her sister off. But Katya immediately stopped in her tracks when she locked eyes with the creature. She knows the creature's glowing red eyes were three times bigger than hers, and it was communicating with her, asking for help. She couldn't see an open mouth or any smile. The creature had a sad expression, and it was shrunken back as if it were cowering in fear. The three girls agreed that the creature had been acting muddle-headed or mentally confused so take a look at this being that they saw crouching against the wall i was clearly terrified not knowing what to do does that look like a human to you would you mistake that as a human if you mm, saw that absolutely not it looks like an ant 
an a ant. very large ant. Okay. Like, what? And how does it look like an ant to you? I don't know, because its body is kind of slimy and brown. Is it crawling on its legs? No, I'm just saying it looks like, you know, is in the movie, ants. Carrying a large chip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it looks it's like scary. a... It kind of reminds me of like a gray alien. So this thing's like four, four feet tall, four to mm -hmm. five feet maybe. Slimy. It's got these V toes to Oily it. Oily is probably the right word. But it's got these like three like Shiny. kind of horns on its head almost. Yeah. It's very interesting. It's very, it is, I guess you kind of say it's bug like. Yeah. In a way. I think so. I see what you mean with the ant. Yeah. Ant part, but maybe it is just. And it's got red eyes. And no, and no discernible glowing. mouth, really, which is mm. interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, in some of the drawings. Yeah, but I think the, the actual description, they don't remember seeing a, mm. a nose or mouth. You guys, I am so excited about today's sponsor, Earth Breeze. I have become a huge Earth Breeze fan in the past year. Let me tell you why it is so much better than traditional laundry detergent. First of all, traditional laundry detergent comes in these giant plastic jugs, which is inconvenient. They're heavy, they're bulky, they take up a ton of space. And the biggest point here is that 91% of them end up in landfills and in our oceans, harming our planet and marine life. There has to be a better way. And it's not like you can just stop doing laundry. So do what I did and switch to Earth Breeze. Earth Breeze laundry detergent eco sheets look like dryer sheets, but they're not. They're a revolutionary liquidless laundry detergent that dissolve 100% in any wash cycle, hot or cold. And there's no measuring involved, no mess, no heavy plastic jugs. You just toss the sheet in. They really have made the whole concept of detergent better. The packaging is lightweight, biodegradable, and plastic free. And it's great for all laundry lifestyles, including people with sensitive skin. Their eco sheets are hypoallergenic and dermatologist tested. Plus, they offer flexible subscriptions that can be adjusted, paused, or canceled by you at any time. No contracts or fees. They're delivered right to your door via free carbon neutral shipping at a frequency that you can set that works for your unique lifestyle. And most importantly here, people, you still get a powerful clean. Take it from me. Earth Breeze is tough on stains, fights odors, and your clothes come out clean every time. Having 10 pets and a nine month old, my clothes and her clothes get really dirty. And if they can work for our clothes, they can work for your clothes. Let me tell you that. But don't take my word for it. You can try it out for yourself with their risk-free 100% satisfaction guarantee. And if you don't like it, Earth Breeze will give you a full refund. No questions asked and no return necessary. So switch from the old-fashioned goo to something new. Right now, our listeners can subscribe to Earth Breeze and save 40%. Just go to earthbreeze.com slash milehire to get started. That's earthbreeze.com slash milehire for 40% off earthbreeze.com slash mile higher. As you can imagine, the girls were petrified. Liliane had seen enough, so she grabbed Katya and the three ran. After a while, the girls stopped to catch their breasts and asked each other what had just happened. The girls being born and raised Catholics actually believed that this creature they encountered was a demon. Which I can kind of see. It mm -hmm. is very demon-like. Yeah, the red the eyes red I could eyes. definitely see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they're thinking maybe they're seeing like uh, apparition of a demon or something or hallucinating even. Louisa, the mother of the Silva girls, said that she had a sixth sense and came to meet the girls outside when they approached the house. She saw that they were walking and slowly kind of dragging each other and that they looked really scared. Louisa made the girls take her back to the spot and Louisa didn't see any aliens or spacecraft when she got there, but she did smell a strong scent that was worse than sulfur. She also saw a footprint in the mud. It was a round foot with three long toe prints. And when the scent hit her nose, she grabbed Katya and they all immediately left. And Louisa said that she could smell the sulfur for 20 days. It just wouldn't go away. And at one point she tried rinsing her nose with alcohol and water, but even that didn't work. The girls tried telling their story at the time, but the media and the public responded with a mix of ridicule and amusement but their stories have apparently stayed the same for two and a half decades. Earlier that day, multiple townspeople witnessed two military trucks driving through town. Some of them followed the trucks to the military blockade six miles away from the crash site in a residential area. There were four or five soldiers blocking the street with their rifles pointed down. One witness even tried to cross the blockade. He told the soldiers that this was a free country and you could go where you pleased, but the soldiers just shook their heads no. 
and when the witness tried to force his way through, the soldiers raised their rifles at him. Obviously, the witness was scared, so he backed down. He'd never seen a gun that size before, much less had one pointed at him, and he'd never seen military trucks in Virginia before. Later on, the IPM, which is the Military Police Inquiry, explained that these were military trucks going in for scheduled maintenance, of course. A Brazilian military captain named Eduardo Calza said that there was also a parade for new inductees to the sergeant's training school. The Brazilian military did perform an IPM in the Virginia incident. For some time, the report was secret and the public did not have access to its contents. But eventually, the Brazilian army released their 357-page IPM report, which we'll be referencing this report quite a bit throughout this episode. According to ufologist Obira Jara Rodriguez, the local fire department, which is controlled by the military police in Brazil, captured one of the aliens in the morning. They had gone to the area after several concerned residents called them and reported seeing something strange. So when they arrived to the scene, the creature had gone into the woods. The firemen followed it and dispersed the witnesses. The firemen then were able to capture the creature with a net. When they came back, the firemen told the witnesses that they'd caught an animal in the forest. The firemen didn't say they found anything strange. They just said that the creature cried like a child. Very weird. And later that afternoon, about three hours after the girls left the spot, a local police officer captured another one of the aliens. One of these police officers was 23-year-old Marco Eli Chirese. Marco was an officer with the intelligence of the military police in Minas Gerais. Later that evening, he and fellow officer Eddie Lopes were driving near the spot where the girls had spotted the alien. They were on the lookout for anything suspicious, and suddenly, when they were driving, the strange creature darted across the street right in front of them. So the officers immediately stopped their car and hopped out and Marco immediately sprang into action with his bare hands. Bare hands. He's That's incredibly badass. brave. Yeah. He grabs this creature, restrained it, and put it into the back of his car. It had been pretty easy for him to capture it, although the creature apparently scratched him. From there, he drove the creature to the local hospital. I'm thinking this, if this is an alien, it's having trouble surviving in our our atmosphere like maybe it doesn't breathe oxygen yeah like we do so it makes sense easy that's why it'd be easy because it's like do you believe an alien would be easy to capture maybe i guess probably not if it's you know taken out of its element or maybe like the ship is protecting it's like super weak yeah it's weak and worn down and i guess it did just crash into the earth so maybe it's got its brain rattled a little bit Now, Marco could very distinctly smell the creature on his body and clothes after he'd captured it. And he noticed that the creature's body had left behind some sort of weird, sticky, greasy film on his body. And shortly after this alleged incident, Marco developed an infection. And three weeks went by and the infection just got worse and worse. It was as if his immune system was just shutting down. One of the doctors who treated Marco was named Cesario Lincoln Furtado. Cesario said his illness was unlike anything he'd ever seen in his entire medical career. When his sister Marta Tavares heard the story of the ET in Virginia, she asked Marco if it was true. And he told her, quote, look, this story will be a big deal. On February 10th at 7 a.m., Marco was admitted to the regional hospital and he told Marta, find out what I have because I don't feel that bad. Doctors couldn't figure out what the source of the infection was. They ran all the tests, but they couldn't determine the cause. All they found was an immunodeficiency of unknown cause. And Marco's body did not react to antibiotics. And what's crazy is, according to Marta, Marco's medical report stated that tests indicated, quote, the presence of granular toxin. It shows 8% of fine grain neutrophils. And in case you guys are wondering, neutrophils are the most common type of white blood cells. Both high and low levels mean the body is under stress. Low levels are associated with conditions including aplastic anemia, chemotherapy, influenza, aka the flu, radiation therapy or exposure, a viral infection, and widespread bacterial infections. Toxic granules and neutrophils can signal an infection, inflammation, or the autoimmune condition aplastic anemia. And 5 to 6% is considered mildly elevated, and anything over 10% should be checked out by a doctor. Marta said that, of course, her brother was restricted from talking about the alien incident. Back in 1997, she spoke on live TV, and she confirmed that her brother was working on the 20th, and all her family knew that he was participating in some sort of secret operation. 
But Cesario said that Marco eventually was honest about the incident, and that's because he was fighting for his life and he was worried he would die. The infection became so severe that Marco actually passed away in the ICU on February 15th, which is 26 days after the girls saw the alien. Marco's family never got an official explanation about his death. And Marta said that the on-call doctor, Luis Alberto Severo, wanted to bury Marco as fast as possible. Valeria, Marco's wife, said that nobody had seen Marco's medical report. She said when officials came to deliver it, it had taken a long time and they first wanted money for it. There was also pages missing from this report. She kept asking for an explanation as to what happened to him, but none came and nobody had any answers for her. Many people believe that the infection was caused by an unknown alien pathogen that Marco contracted when he was scratched by the alien. But other people strongly believe that this infection had a tragic but earthly explanation. Marco reportedly had a cyst in his left armpit that he had surgically removed by a military doctor on February 7th, 1996. And this surgery had been scheduled for weeks by this point, even before the incident. So the cyst was removed and Marco developed a fever. He'd also began to complain of severe pain in different parts of his body. The IPM report states that Marco had no involvement in the events of January 20th. Many people have claimed, though, that he had. Sadly, of course, Marco is no longer around to tell people what really happened. UFO investigators requested to have his body exhumed so it could be studied, but a judge obviously turned them down. Also, it was reported that a witness saw two aliens at the hospital that day. According to the IPM report, the aliens that the witness claimed to have seen at the hospital were actually a couple with dwarfism there to deliver their baby. As per the Mayo Clinic, the most common cause of dwarfism is a disorder called achandroplasia, which is caused disproportionately. It causes a very like short stature, and this disorder usually results in the average like size torso, short arms and legs, short fingers, very limited mobility in the elbows, and then a disproportionately large head with a prominent forehead and a flattened bridge of the nose, bowed, bowed legs, hunched lower back, and at a height of around four feet when you're an adult. This just seems like a, a poor excuse to, yeah. to try to cover up what was actually going on because mm -hmm. there's obviously no similarity between the way that these beings are being described and um, somebody with dwarfism other yeah. than how tall they are potentially but right. other than that there's literally no similarities there so it's just a convenient way to be like oh yeah it was actually this plus don't think, you think it, they would know right like they're not they don't have oily skin how hard right. would it be they're to tell red like, eyes no like, it's honestly offensive i agree i yeah it's extremely offensive well, it doesn't even explain the other things going on, too, like there are reports of military vehicles delivering mm -hmm. strange machinery to the hospital. The IPM reported that this was just the military police delivering cardiovascular equipment, so nothing out of the ordinary. If you're, if you're not catching on already, this IPM report is definitely like the cover-up right, of this incident to try and you know, explain away everything. But apparently in Brazil, the military police handle everything. There's no local police forces like there are in the U.S., so when you call the police in Brazil, that's who responds. They also do transport large equipment to hospitals and stuff like that. And again, the military police also run the fire department. So, you know, it, you know, the way that they're saying things happen could technically happen, but it really doesn't explain everything. One witness reported seeing an army truck enter the back gate of the Humanitas Hospital that evening. The men then loaded up the now dead creature into the truck in the presence of other military police, army men, nurses, and doctors. I believe it was like in this, um, special box almost like an aluminum box from there the dead creature was taken by convoy to the city of trace corazones and the live creature was also lit up and taken to campinas where he arrived still living in the last year i've changed healthcare providers meaning i've got to find a new doctor and for some reason finding a new doctor before i started using zocdoc was like trying to find a needle in a haystack well, ZocDoc makes it extremely easy to find quality medical professionals for whatever care you need. ZocDoc is the only free app out there that lets you find and book doctors who are patient reviewed, take your insurance, are available when you need them and treat almost every condition under the sun. They simplify the process by going through their app or website. 
you just type in the insurance provider that you have. You type in what kind of care you're looking for. I was just looking for a new primary care physician. Type in your zip code and boom, it gives you a list of doctors in your area. It gives you reviews, which I mean, we're in the review age. We're reviewing everything. I mean, I'm reviewing everything from my doctor to who's scooping my dog's poop. Okay. It's serious stuff out there. You got to make sure you find the right professionals for the job and ZocDoc makes it easier than ever. You get to see other ZocDoc users and what they had to say about the doctor. But the best thing about ZocDoc is the fact that you can just schedule an appointment right there on the app. And oftentimes there's appointments available within days. Think of ZocDoc as your trusted guide when it comes to your healthcare professionals. No more doctor roulette or scouring the internet for questionable reviews. With ZocDoc, you have a trusted guide to connect you to your favorite doctor you haven't met yet. Millions of people use ZocDoc's free app to find and book a doctor in their neighborhood who is patient reviewed and fits their needs and scheduled just right. Seriously, love ZocDoc, been using it for a number of years, even before they sponsored the show. They really do make the process of getting a doctor's appointment scheduled. You can do your paperwork on there. I mean, it is just so simple and it makes life so much easier when you can get on the schedule as soon as you need it. They eliminate all of that for you. So go to ZocDoc.com slash milehire and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top rated doctor today. Many are available within 24 hours. That's ZocDoc.com slash milehire. ZocDoc.com slash milehire. The U.S. Air Force then confiscated the alien bodies and took them to an unknown location. The Brazilian authorities have allegedly been covering up the incident ever since. The IPM found that this ambulance transporting the suspicious parcel was actually carrying a body that was exhumed as part of an unrelated criminal investigation. I was also just going to say, too, in case you're confused, you're like, why is the U.S. Air Force confiscating the bodies in Brazil? There's actually a, a U.S. Air Force base in Brazil. No uh, shit. They're yeah. everywhere. No, I know. But I'm just saying some people might be confused by that. So I know. No, good clarification. I didn't mean no, sh no shit to you. <laughs> I'm just saying like they are. Oh, that the U.S. military everywhere. is everywhere. I mean, they're not yeah. in every country, but yeah, they in pretty lot, much they, they find most good locations in all the continents to mm -hmm. be. So that's why they're, you know, involved in shooting down the UFO and they're there to recover it. So this story quickly became a very hot story in Brazil. Hot. <laughs> the girls were interviewed by newspapers, magazines, and TV programs. So Nia Nadea was a reporter from TV Princesa who covered the case back in 1996, and he remembers that day well. A large storm was rolling in, and as night fell, news of the alien sighting reached the station, so he went to go check it out. But when he got to the location, he said that there were army trucks blocking his path. They told Nia that he couldn't pass. When he asked why, he was told, this is an issue of national security. Nie and his team believed that there was a cover-up going on. Later, two of Nie's crew members went down to ESA to get some answers about the sighting. A sergeant met them at the gate. They asked if he could answer any questions about the event. The sergeant went inside and then came back out and told them, if you ask one more question, you'll be arrested. That's not suspicious at all. Right. Mm -hmm. Ask one more question about this and you're going to be arrested. One local woman said that the sighting was the biggest event in Virginia's recent history. She wished the army hadn't gotten to the aliens before the locals did. That's because she said the locals would have scrubbed them clean, get that nasty smell off of them if they can, teach them Portuguese, and try to develop a peaceful relationship with them. Maybe a little bit of uh, Brazilian food on the side, you know, let them try the, <laughs> try the, the native food. <laughs> Stop. But they never had the chance to. No. It's really unfortunate, man. Could have been. This could have been <laughs> our first incident of peaceful contact. It could have become one of with us. With our alien brethren. But you know what? The military had to go and fuck it up like they always do. Of course. And That's the locals what they're kept, here to do. Yeah. It, they always do that. They always just mess things up everywhere they go. The military messed things up. And locals kept trying to demand answers from the military about the incident. They had a pretty good reason not to trust them. In 1985, an impressive 20-year dictatorship in Brazil ended. So at the time, 1996, these brutal years were still in everyone's recent memories. During that time, the Brazilian military dealt with its political opponents by disappearing them without a trace. So the thinking was, if they did this to humans, then 
why wouldn't they do this to these extraterrestrials now? Like we said before, the Brazilian military released an IPM related to the Virginia incident, but they concluded in this report that the alien sighting was actually just a case of mistaken identity. In 2016, the Brazilian news outlet G1 reached out to the military for comment on the Virginia incidents. The army responded saying that the IPM was established in 1996 to 1997, and they said this IPM was forwarded to the audit of the 4th Military Judicial Circumscription in Juiz de Fora, Minas Gerais. The case was closed when the IPM concluded. The army also told G1 that there are no documents dealing with UFO issues in the archives of the Brazilian army, which is a load of crap too. <laughs> the report states that the girls confused a local resident for an alien. Uh, that's a pretty big mischaracterization yeah. if you ask me. Come on. What? That is How dumb do you think these girls are? I know. It's offensive again. This local resident was known by the nickname Mujinho or Little Mute because he was nonverbal. We actually have footage of Mujinho. He's blurred. But here's the clip. Okay, so... So this is the person that, that they, they think these girls thought was an alien and went running home terrified, complaining of this foul smell that the mother also smells. No. Bullshit. Absolutely not. That's, that's just insulting. Shit. It is insulting. To their intelligence and to this poor guy. Agreed. Come on. They think people are going to believe that? Yeah, apparently. This is easy for, easier for people to just take that and say, okay, that explains it. That's ridiculous. Moving on. Ridic ridiculous. Because I'm sure, like, ugh, just can't even deal with the stupidity of this report. Mujinho was a 30-year-old intellectually disabled man named Luis Antonio J. Paula, who lived in the home with his parents. Other reports say that he was a homeless person and that he was mentally ill. He would frequently crouch over to examine things on the ground like cigarette butts and sticks. Mujinho also frequently wore a diaper, and he was known to hang out in the area where the girls spotted an alien. He liked to sit in crouch positions, similar to how the girls describe the alien. But again, for all three of them to get confused and think that this person is an alien, come on. And the girls claim that they know Mujinho. They said that they had given him cigarettes before, so they wouldn't have confused him with a goddamn alien. Mujinho is still in Virginia as of 2016. It's been theorized that he is the creature that the girls saw that night. And that's what the IPM concluded. The lead author of the report wrote specifically, the more probable hypothesis is that this citizen, probably dirty due to the rains and crouching next to a wall, was mistaken by the three terrified girls for a space creature. No. Come on now. No. The, the one characteristic that the girls all noticed was the eyes. And the eyes, mm -hmm. they said, they were very specific about the eyes. They said the eyes were three times bigger than a human eye and they were bright red, almost glowing. Yeah, so it's not like a, a red yeah. iris. Like, no, no, like bright eyes. And they were kind of like almond shaped too. Mm -hmm. The whole thing was red. But many people believed a cover up was at play, including Louisa, who had a terrifying visit from some unknown people later. One night around 9 p.m., Louisa said that four men she'd never seen before in dark suits showed up to their house while the girls were already asleep. They actually came into the house, placed the briefcase on the table, and told Louisa to shut the door. The men were foreigners and were not Brazilian. They presented Louisa with a briefcase full of $100 bills, and they promised her the money, and they even offered to relocate them outside the country if the girls agreed to say they were lying and made the whole incident up. Interesting. Literally, like the men in black showed up. You know, keep this quiet we'll you know we'll make you guys uh wealthy and move you out of here but you can't say anything about it and the fact that they turned that down good move yeah that says a lot yeah that they turned it down that's how sure they were yeah louisa was like you're calling my daughters liars how can you do that they'd seen what they seen which would also make louisa a liar too and she did not like that so she told them to get the hell out of the house or she'd call the police they, you know, kept trying to push her and kept on insisting to take the money, but then they suddenly left. And one day, Carlos J. Sousa was sitting in a coffee shop when he was approached by two men. They were very tall and they were also dressed in black suits. And they asked if he was Carlos J. Sousa. And he started listing off his family members by name. 
Carlos asked one of the men who he was and how he knew so much about him, but the man told him that he didn't see anything, to shut up, go away, and if someone asks, you didn't see anything. You don't know anything, and if you don't, things are going to get very weird for you, so get out of here. The men drove a dark blue or black Opala, and they left right after they told Carlos to get out of here. So Liliane and Valkyria are both now married with children. Together, they run a snack bar in the center of the city where they sell natural juices. Katya is separated from the man that she was married to at the time of the incident, and unfortunately, she is unemployed as of 2016, although it's been a long time since then, so maybe things have changed. Here's what the girls have to say about the incident today. If they all had the opportunity to speak to the world about their experience, what would they like the world to know? Ah, para mim não foi boa não. Eu, eu, se fosse para me passar por isso hoje, eu não passaria. They said it wasn't a good experience at all. If they could choose, they wouldn't go through it again. Mm -hmm. and, and only people who have been through what they have been through can tell what, you know, what how they felt and how they, it all affected their lives. How has it changed their lives? Como isso afetou a vida de vocês? Em tudo. No trabalho, na escola. She said it affected everything, like from friendships, work to school, people getting away from them, people thinking they were, you know, crazy or something. Alguém pode chegar, não, foi assim, pegamos e levamos para tal lugar. She just says that she hopes that one day the whole thing will come clear and she will, you know, her word will be taken seriously and they'll know that she was always telling the truth. It's so unfair to be these people who witness something like this, that you are forever looked at differently. And it's not like you can just forget what you've seen. It's so impactful. And then to go, I mean, no one would choose this, right? They're not getting anything from this. No. And to have your, your character question for yeah. like the rest of your life is yep. insane. They said that the experience completely changed their life. They lost their friends. People would tell them that they were crazy. Journalists continually hounded them and harassed them. They just hope that one day people will believe them and that the world will accept their experiences. The military police, fire department, and ESA have always denied involvement in the case. Traditionally, the military can't comment on isolated incidents. Their official stance on the issue was the same since the 1996 incident. But over the years, some military officials have spoken to ufologists about the Virginia incident. And one even sat for a recorded interview with ufologist Marco Pecci. And the town became somewhat famous, especially in the UFO community for sightings. Tourism actually went up following the event. And today, the town seems to embrace the UFO tale. They even built a water tower in the shape of a massive flying saucer in the center of the town to commemorate it. There's also an ET museum in Virginia, and today ufologists still visit the area to study the incident. Yeah, they even have like replicas of of the being in different mm -hmm. parts of, of, of the town as well. I think in like the town square they have one. And what's really interesting is that even the mayor of Virginia mm -hmm. believes that this happened the way that the girls and everybody else who actually witnessed the event say it went down and it seems like the majority of people who live there believe them as well um in the documentary they literally just put up like they were up holding sign. signs like come talk to us yeah. about the 1996 Virginia mm -hmm. incident and people would come up and there yeah. was tons of people that remembered bits and pieces of mm -hmm. what they saw that day and fully believe it and that the military was there which was weird yeah and there was a bunch of activities so I hope I'm not the only one when I say that when I turned 18 years old, one thing that I did almost immediately was get a credit card. It was very easy for me to acquire another one and then another one. And before I knew it, I had four or five credit cards completely maxed out and I found myself in a bit of a situation. I realized that, oh, I've got to pay these credit cards completely off at the end of the month or I'm going to get slapped with interest charges. I was completely in the dark when it came to how to manage debt. After a while, it was just getting overwhelming. I was paying tons and tons of money every single month because of the interest they were putting on my bills to the point where I finally discovered a personal loan option, much like what PDS Debt offers. Except the difference between PDS Debt and the personal loan that I ended up getting is that PDS Debt 
has customized 0% interest options. My personal loan at the time actually still had interest. It just allowed me to use that loan to pay off all the credit cards so that I consolidate that debt into one monthly payment. And I gotta say, it was amazing to be able to get completely credit card debt free, I think within a year, thanks to this personal loan. So if you're somebody out there who's struggling with debt, credit card debt, and you just don't know what to do, then you need to check out PDS Debt. PDS Debt rolls all of your payments into one low 0% interest monthly payment, and everyone with over $10,000 or more in debt qualifies, and there's no minimum credit score required. Even bad and fair credit are accepted. You save thousands in interest and fees, and you're able to pay off your debt in a fraction of the time. It's super easy to check out everything that PDS Debt has to offer because PDS Debt is offering free debt analysis to our listeners just for completing the quick and easy debt assessment at www.pdsdebt.com slash mh. That's P-D-S-D-E-B-T dot com slash mh. Take back your financial freedom today by visiting pdsdebt.com slash mh. In 2022, the New York Post spoke exclusively with two people who had reportedly had knowledge of the Virginia UFO incident. One of them was Vittorio Pacassini, a civilian UFO investigator. Vittorio told the Post that in 2012, a senior Brazilian officer showed him a 35-second clip of the creature. Here's how Vittorio described the clip. He said it was skinny, weak, and fragile. It had brown skin with an oil or grease on the body. It had a big head with red eyes and no pupils. The face was like a reptile, almost like a frog with strange red eyes, three times bigger than ours, and three protuberances on the top of its head. Vittorio said the creature was alive, but it looked like it was about to die, and it made a little sound like a bee. He claims to have taken seven interviews with at least seven military officers about the Virginia encounters. He says he's holding these tapes in a secure, secret location, and he actually accused the Brazilian military of covering up the incident. Vittorio says that after he did this on four separate occasions, drivers have bumped into his car on the highway. Two shots were fired at his car during the fourth incident. He says he's gotten hundreds of death threats and he actually moved to Italy in 2004 in order to escape the harassment. Vittorio actually wrote a book on the incident with journalist Maxis Ezes Porges that was published in late 1996. The Brazilian army and their records labeled the book and its authors as naive and said they give credibility to untrue statements, so basically called them liars. He was spoken to as part of the IPM, but since the army concluded the Virginia incident was all a misunderstanding, nothing ever really came of it. Another UFO investigator named Patricia Fernandez Silva claimed that Brazilian officials spoke to her about the incident. She said that in 2014, after the Virginia mayor learned that she was a UFO researcher, he invited her to an office building to talk. Patricia said that she was greeted by the mayor and four other officers. They interrogated her for hours about the incident, even though she told them that she'd never even researched the case before. She said that she had heard of it, but had no involvement in it herself. At one point, the senior officer asked the others to leave the room, and that's when he showed Patricia a colored photo. It had been shot on film and printed on Kodak paper. The photo showed two creatures. One was dead, and the other was crouching the same way the girls had described in 1996. Patricia said that the creature had three high abscesses on his forehead, and she said that the creature's eyes were black, which was the only difference between her and the girl's descriptions. The creature had that same shiny, wet, damp, greasy skin like it had just stepped out of a pool. But she said it was not oily, but kind of gooey looking. The creature's mouth was also very small. The senior official asked Patricia, are you sure you don't know anything about this day? Look at the photo. Patricia was scared, but she told him that she had no knowledge. Now, Patricia said that the former sheriff had cupped hands and he struggled to take the photo out of an old newspaper inside of a transparent folder. And the sheriff explained that his hands had been paralyzed after he tried grabbing the creature by the legs back in 1996. If that's true. Mm, that is interesting. How did that work? Some kind of like, I wonder if it's because whatever the substance on it whether it's gooey yeah. or oily is like a. I mean it seems like it's a toxin or something it. yeah yeah, yeah interesting very weird 
The Virginia hmm. incident has attracted a lot of attention recently with the release of director James Fox's film, which I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, Moment of Contact, which is available for free to watch on Crackle or, you know, if you want to support James Fox, you can rent it on Amazon Prime and YouTube as well, which you might have actually seen a prior documentary that James Fox put out called The Phenomenon, also very good. In Moment of Contact, James takes another look at the incident. He actually flies to Brazil to interview townspeople, witnesses to the UFO and alien visits. Here's a clip of James Fox interviewing some of the people of Virginia. The 1996 Virginia UFO incident. What do you think? You find so a maneuver of that size with so many vehicles involving both army and police simultaneously. They closed the roads and wouldn't let us pass. Something happened that left us very suspicious. I really believe in the ET case in Virginia. It was round, a round shape. It was round. And it was turning. It seemed to be looking for something because it came closer. So we were only here for an hour and a half, and I can't believe how many people we got to come forward. What I love about this case is it's recent enough where people either heard accounts or experienced things themselves. That's a great point. I think most of the times mm -hmm. when we're talking about these UFO stories, it's from years and years and years ago. So it's really hard to kind of like wrap your head around it and necessarily believe some of the eyewitnesses. And obviously, it's yeah. coming through text most of the time they don't have like actual video interviews of of people who who witnessed it but they just went into the town square with signs and these people just came up to them and yeah. started talking about it james also talks to carlos j Souza, the ultralight plane pilot who saw the ufo crash in the Mylini farm after 26 years james and his crew actually took carlos back to that pasture to see if he could still find the crash site as you can imagine a lot has changed in 26 years a lot of those visual markers that carlos had were now gone but thankfully, Carlos was able to find the crash site. And just this is why you need to watch the documentary because you can watch this scene play out in, you know, in its full length. And it, he actually becomes very emotional to the point where he like kneels down on the ground and, and you can just tell like those memories are, are coming back in. And it's, it's so overwhelming for him emotionally that he actually starts crying. And he says, beings died here. He's sad for the, for the aliens yeah, that yeah, died. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah, pretty powerful. James and his team also spoke to a family who saw a UFO hovering over the area of the alien sighting and capture. It looked like it was looking for something, like it was doing a grid search. Maybe it was like aliens looking for the others, you know, like looking for its uh, crashed comrade. The family was respected in the area, so they didn't want their faces shown, but they did give filmmakers their story. The father said that day he had gone outside to pick up food from a motorcycle delivery man, and that's when he noticed a large object over the house. One of the girls saw a red light. It was very red, solid, silver, all around, spherical, and it was rotating very fast. The father said it was a flying disc. It looked very abnormal, like it was from another planet. The two girls were scared, and the three of them all watched the craft for 10 to 15 minutes as it hovered and rotated like it was searching for something. About a week later, people came. Ubir Jara and some Americans, as well as ufologists, and even people from NASA, apparently, came and talked to the family for a while. But they told the family after they talked that this conversation never happened. Another witness that was in the Brazilian Navy told James that he was at a bank making a transaction when he saw a bunch of Navy vehicles entering the ESA barracks. This witness finished up at the bank and went outside, where he saw Navy helicopters over ESA, which he thought was unusual. He also saw a Navy truck parked outside, and they were quickly shoving a metal box inside of it. The witness was wondering why they would be taking this box out of the infirmary. Navy men were ordering people to get out of there. The witness said that the commanding general had heard rumors that they'd gone to Virginia and picked up some creature. The witness's squadron was involved in the transportation, so he avoided talking about it. But soon after, the drivers who went to Virginia were ordered to go to the commander's office. Nobody ever saw them again. Their captain, Edson Ramirez, left for Brasilia without saying goodbye. James also talked to an anonymous radiologist who worked in the regional hospital in January of 1996. The radiologist said that there were a lot of military police presence outside of the hospital on the 20th, and nobody was allowed to move in or out. The witness noticed some army and policemen who had a box and something inside of a black zip body bag. They asked the radiologist to perform an x-ray on these parts of the creature, the skull, cervical spine, thorax, abdomen, pelvis, 
and arms and legs. The radiologist said the military men kept their eyes on him at all times to observe what he was doing, but they didn't speak to him or each other. The x-rays were developed, but the radiologist didn't see them. They were all taken by the military that day, which was odd because as the radiologist, he usually verified them. Someone then thanked him for his work, told him his job was done, and instructed him not to comment on anything he saw or did. The radiologist said that the creature smelled like a mix between sulfur and ammonia, and even though that section of the hospital was thoroughly clean and disinfected, the smell persisted. They even had to close off that section to the public because it was just so strong. And the next day, people were complaining about the odor. The radiologist couldn't get the smell out of his nose for three or four days. The next witness James talked to was an ex-military man who was allegedly involved in transporting the creature back in 1996. He did not want his identity revealed out of fear of army retaliation. So he referred to him as Military X. And he told the filmmakers that June 20th was a normal day at first. Around 9 or 9.30, he was summoned to an officer named Vanderlei's office. Military X and the other officers were told to round up trucks for a mission. They didn't say what the mission was, they just said they were going to Virginia. The men were then ordered to follow some unmarked non-military vehicles. One of them was a combi. And whenever these vehicles stopped, so did Military X's crew. Once they got to Virginia, they stayed put for a little while. But then military personnel belonging to S2, which is the Brazilian Army's secret service, were ordered to stay there until further notice. So three soldiers who were driving different vehicles were told to move to different locations. Military X followed an S2 member through the downtown area, past the regional hospital to Humanitas Hospital. They were ordered to back the trucks into the back gate of the hospital. And inside the hospital, Military X saw a stainless steel table with a box on top. Doctors and people carrying clipboards were analyzing the creature, and it seemed like they were scared of it. When Military X saw the creature, he saw, quote, a different creature with very oily skin, like silicone, and this made him scared. The other people in the room seemed very tense and unsure of what was happening, and the creature's foot looked like it had split V-shaped toes, kind of like the Vulcan salute. This led Military X to believe that the creature was not human. He couldn't look at it very long before he himself got frightened. When he turned away, his expression changed. A fire department soldier waved Military X away and told him to leave. So he took a step back and turned to leave. But on his way out, he noticed something to the right of the box. There was a soldier with a camera slung over his shoulder. But he wasn't filming though. But Military X believes that there is video footage of this creature. On January 22, 1996, Military X drove the creature from Humanitas Hospital in Virginia to the ASA base in Trace Horasoes. It stayed there overnight, and after Military X and the other officers parked the truck, soldiers started asking what Military X and another officer saw. Military X said that he had thought he'd seen a burnt man or something like that, but the officer stopped him and he said, no, that's not what you saw. What I saw was supernatural. The next day, the creature was transported via convoy from Asa Trace Corosoes to Isfex Army Base in Campinas. Military X thinks they did a study on the creature there, but the rumor was that it was being taken to the United States because Brazil was not equipped to take care of it. Military X has said that if anyone talked about what they saw that day, the punishment would be very severe. So this was something that he had to live with and keep a secret for his entire life. James also talked to an air traffic controller, Jose Manuel Fernandez, and he and his unit were tasked with monitoring specific airspace over the state of Sao Paulo. So what he knows of the Virginia incident is this. A U.S. Air Force aircraft landed in Campinas. Two helicopters took off from the Campinas airport to an unknown place that was later revealed to be Virginia. The helicopters picked up something unknown and then returned to Campinas. Then the unknown parcel was loaded into a U.S. Air Force plane. The U.S. Air Force plane took off, and that was that. Jose and his unit were instructed to keep quiet about the mission. Brazilians supported the ground operation only, but the rest were Americans. Jose knew that Americans were involved because they landed without the authorization of the Brazilian government. The mission was a secret, and it was a U.S. Air Force plane. For 26 years, nobody was able to get a hold of Eric Lopes, the officer who witnessed Marco capture the creature. 
James Fox and his crew were able to track him down at his home. But when they tried asking him questions, he wanted no part of that. He told them to leave or else he would kick them out with bullets. Marta said that back in 1996, the police told her mother that the story of the ET was true, but they couldn't admit to the public or else the population would collapse. There's so much damning evidence here Mm -hmm. to push me in the direction of that this was real. This really happened the way that all of these witnesses to various parts of the story said it did. I mean, the fact that there was this huge military presence there out of nowhere, seemingly. Mm -hmm. And this is coming from someone who was in the military themselves. Right, right. Like we said earlier, very scared to do this interview. Did it, you know, with his back facing the camera. Yep, yep. Um, Plus, yeah, I think what's leaning me in the direction of belief as well is the similarities between people's stories. They really line up. Yeah, and the drawings of the creatures are all Mm -hmm. consistent. They all look pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. They all have the same characteristics. So, And and this was more recent. This is only 96. So I know that seems like ancient history to some out there, but this really wasn't that that long ago. So we were alive. A lot of, yeah. Yeah, it was a little little toddler. You know, playing with my little UFOs and my little (laughs) alien action figures while this was going on. Oh, come on. You know, you weren't allowed to have that stuff. I was. You I were? could watch E.T., yeah. I watched E.T. Oh, as a kid. Oh, yeah. E.T. You were the movie. scared of it, right? No, that was my brother. My brother was terrified of E.T. Oh, I right. loved E.T. I thought E.T. was amazing. Mm. My brother was absolutely traumatized by E.T. I see why. E.T. is It was a little scary. freaky. Kind of looks like these creatures, though, a little bit, doesn't he? E.T.? You know, he kind of does. Without, had, the, like, like, the, the red slimy eyes, slimy green or, like, brownish skin. Yeah. I feel like his feet are yeah. similar, too. Doesn't he have bumps on his head, kind of? I think mm-hmm. his head's actually smooth. Oh, is it? I almost wonder if the bumps on the head are a result of the crash, like the abscesses or something, or it was like a reaction to um, being in this atmosphere or something. So with all this said and done, you think this happened the way that it, they believe it went down and what everybody witnessed? Yeah, I mean, I can't say for sure. Like I said, I like, tend give to me a percentage lean that way. Out of a percentage 100. of belief. I'm going to say 79%. <laughs> 79%? Yeah. Where are you? Like a C plus? Uh, I'll tell yeah. you. Yeah. Because I, I, it's hard without... There's not that many people. Actually, there's even more soldiers that have come forward over the years to give testimony that mm-hmm. they were a part of this operation that took place that day. Well, I'm just saying like if I... Like aerial school phenomenon, I believe like 98, 99%. I'm like Why pretty Why is that higher that. for you than Because this? there's so many people... But they're kids. That makes me believe them more because I don't think they'd be able to all consistently tell the same story. Yeah, I mean, they, for the most part, did. There's definitely some some nuances to their stories a little bit. And mm-hmm. the way that the creatures looked when they draw drew them outward a little bit different for everybody. Yeah, well, they're, they are kids, but... What about the Westall incident? That was kids, but mm-hmm. they were teenagers. True. Yeah. Yeah, the Westall one point. is very blue, is another one that's like a... Yeah, mark of I'm like UFO right there, counters. like 99, 95 plus, like pretty much believe that. This one is a little harder for me, but I definitely lean in the direction of belief. What about you? What if you had a percentage on this one? Very high, 90s. Okay. 90s for me, for sure. This is up there with like Roswell and um, I still have some questions some about others, Roswell, other some of it. Well, there's because it's the first one and it was so long ago, the a lot of and it was I, I think what's unique about this one is it was it didn't take place in the United States and that's almost a good thing because all the encounters in the United States get covered up and cleaned up very quickly and kind of like and a lot of people get their hands in it and the yeah. story gets really well and the, over the years and the amount of disinformation that's put out there right. about this right. is, is is nuts like you know there's a lot of people that are planted by the government and national security agencies that disseminate information that is just straight up lies Mm -hmm. along with some truths there so you never know you know what's actually real and what's not right they do that on purpose because you know it's always the the lies that overtake the truth so it discredits every single person that comes forward they might say a lot of credible things but then you know they throw a few lies in there and then they're automatically discredited exactly what do you guys think as far as percentage of belief in this case um i would say probably like 80 to 85. Oh, more than me. Wow. Impressive. Yeah. I mean, 
I don't know. I think a lot of them are very compelling. Watching the interviews is, mm -hmm. you know, very interesting and in how how much involvement there was, how there's multiple people involved. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. it's more mm -hmm. convincing when there's more people who are involved in the story versus just like someone, you know, similar to the aerial phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah, that's kind of where I stand. So you don't think this was a hoax at all? Be a very elaborate hoax. Yeah, I was gonna say. I feel like it'd be a lot of work. The amount of people that would have to be in on it. Mm -hmm. And like, why? Why are you? Yeah, and they're. Not, it's not like it's all military personnel either. Right. It's like just average citizens. So it's exactly. very hard to control that. What about you, Julia? Um, it's kind of hard for me to like assign a number to, like. Do I believe that all of these events happened? Do I believe that certain thing, certain ones did, certain ones didn't? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do I believe that the people believe that they saw what they saw? Like it's all yeah. kind of like very different questions to me. And I think I stand the same. Well, I don't know if about the same, but um, I don't know. I wouldn't call myself like a skeptic on this kind of stuff. I do 110% believe that aliens exist. Um. I don't know. It's just hard because I am kind of one of those people that's like, where's the, like, where's the video? Yeah, that's what's hard, hard is like yeah. with all of these claims that we've, you know, ever talked about, there's nothing, there's never like a video or a picture really. It's, you kind of just have to take these people's words for it. And obviously there's like drawings, but. Well, there's also, this is, this is kind of interesting. So there could be a reason for why we don't have amazing video photo evidence for is because the technology of these craft and the way that they're the the propulsion systems are designed is that it actually distorts um the way that our cameras actually capture them so that's why they usually look fuzzy and look grainy is because of the the way that their ships actually work is they're not actually fully in this reality like yeah. they're kind of bleeding bet between dimensions because they're able to traverse space and time in a much different way than we we know of space travel right like right they are able to actually move through almost like portals in space and time in order to get great distances across space and so when they're actually coming into our visible um eyesight or you know in a place where we can see them it is, you know, they're kind of like, it's like, you know, this bleeding over effect where it's kind of like distorting, it's distorting the the gravity and the actual space time that it's in. So when you're taking pictures of it, that's why they always look grainy and, and even like videos, even when the military captures mm -hmm. photo and video evidence of it, it still doesn't look perfect because we're like, oh yeah, well we got, we have, you know, 8K cinema cameras now. How come we can't get an 8K cinema film on, you know, capture of these these ufos and it's because i don't know that our technology has the capability of doing it i don't i don't know that we would be able to even if we had a clear cut shot of it i think there's definitely better photo video evidence out there but it's being suppressed by the intelligence agencies and mm -hmm. you know the powers that be because it is too compelling you know it's even more compelling than what we have but i think we have plenty of evidence that is compelling enough to make one believe and just you know, look at the sheer vastness of the universe. I mean, it doesn't make any sense that there's not life elsewhere out there in the stars. No, I think all four of us can sit here and say we 100% are confident that there are aliens out there, whether or not they yeah. visited or are currently here. I don't know, That's but debated, like, right. I am, there's not a, like not even the teeniest, tiniest bit of doubt in my mind that aliens are out there. Well, and it's like, I think some people get tripped up with the connotations of the word alien when you pose the question more like given like the infinitely expanding universe and how many billions upon billions of planets there are out there what do you think is the the probability that there is life on other planets if you just mm -hmm. put it like life on other planets you know right right then it i think people are more inclined to say oh yeah that makes sense because mathematically speaking it's just like impossible how is there yeah, yeah we can't right. be the only ones you know no we're not alone since we're talking percentage of belief, what percentage would you assign David Huggins? I have to bring up my man, David. David. My favorite. Um, I would, he's one person with, I would you know? be, I'm less inclined to believe him. <laughs> no shit. <laughs> I would say like 
way less, like yeah. less than 50. Less than 50. I would say I I'm like know. a solid 10% on David. Oh, so way less than 50, right? Yeah. Like I really do not <laughs> well, I don't believe... want to offend David. But if well, I'm I being love honest, David. I, I'm I love him. He's, like, a, he's a nice uh, lad. Yeah, I'm just... doing like 20%. David's okay. paintings are really beautiful. I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's got what, some nice art. Yeah. Well, and I think what's intriguing about a lot of these stories is that regardless of like whether or not you believe, there's a really intriguing, really fascinating human story at the heart of all of these. Yes. And mm -hmm. I think it's really just beautiful and fascinating and interesting to look at. So yeah. I think David fully believes it. Yeah. Um, oh, sure. I don't think he's out there like bull, you know, yeah, intentionally knowingly lying. bullshitting. Yeah. No, I don't see that at all. Whether it's hallucinations, dreams or. Yeah. That, reality which is also a, a for debate of like okay so if it is quote-unquote hallucinations or dreams like how do you you know what if what you believe is just a hallucination or just a dream is actually you being visited by et in your sleep yeah and right. we're out here just like oh it's a dream you know then mm -hmm. the lines kind of start to blur our understanding of what he's experiencing exactly very minimal no it's true maybe i should give him 15 percent yeah <laughs> What maybe, do you think, Josh? Maybe his consciousness is just far more it's expanded true. He's just than ours. More evolved than me. Yeah, may, or maybe he can remote remote view or do something like that, where he's you know, so you astral project. You lean, are you like over fifty on David? Oh hell yeah, I'm I'm right there with David. You know, like I <laughs> he was David at one point. David sat down I, I, here <laughs> in the past life. I was David Huggins. Um, he's still alive. Well, I think yeah, David's yeah. alive. Yeah, I think he's alive. Well, maybe my next he, life I'll be Wait. him then. So. Mm. Well, what percentage do you believe, David? Eighty-five. Eighty. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I, I like. I, I tend to believe the experiencers because I think there's, I, I, a everybody else discredits you. So yeah. No, I know. I feel know. bad. No, it's not that I'm I being feel a little bad. Harsh I'm just on like David. I. I. I do think there are people in this world that have expanded consciousness and abilities to mm -hmm. visit other realms and interact with other cosmic entities that we can't even begin to dream about because we're all so damn closed minded and we're no. you know living the in these with aliens prisons thing that everything just gets me I don't yeah know, it's well hard. you know what everybody's got to have sex man it's <laughs> part of life so there's people who claim to have sex with um paranormal yeah no that's true spirits so, yeah absolutely and you know maybe what you've touched on this before josh like is paranormal like ghosts, quote unquote, traditional, what we think of as ghosts, also the same as aliens to some extent. Like, mm. yeah, it could be. You know could what I be, mean? There could be, they could be one and the same for all we know. Here, here's a, here, let me, let me kind of spin things on, on, on its head here for a sec. So, one other theory that I've really started to delve into is this idea of, I, I always find it interesting in all of these alien stories that the aliens are all fairly similar in what they look like physically. They all kind of look like the classic gray alien, you know, big heads, big eyes. They're always like this similar build. They're short and smooth skin and all that. And I find that very, I'm very curious about that because I almost wonder if that is by design and on purpose, but not because there are some extraterrestrial being from another planet but in fact they're they're man-made and one of the things that i think about constantly is i i 100 believe that there are these ufos or these objects or whatever they are you know uap is the term that they use now unidentified aerial phenomena that has been recorded for thousands and thousands of years and so i often wonder if there's some advanced um not extraterrestrial species on this planet, but a, another species that was here prior to this this human civilization as we know it, um, that's existing somewhere either on the planet, inside the planet, under the ocean, even I mean even on our moon potentially. And what we're seeing when it comes to UFOs are actually drones or some type of advanced technology that the, only they have. And you know, perhaps that's what we're seeing when it comes to UFOs. But one thing interesting I wanted to bring up real quick before we wrap things up is Dr. Jacques Vallée. So Dr. Jacques Vallée is a very, very smart individual. He's spent 60 years being a scientist, technologist. He helped NASA map Mars. He's a very reputable individual. He's a venture capitalist. He's worked with the U.S. National Security Agency, and he's done a lot of research into UFOs. And what's interesting in one of his books, I mean, this guy, this guy actually was a close associate of Project Blue Book's J. Allen Hynek, um, which if you know anything about that, um, 
that that should tell you a lot about his credibility. So in one of his latest books, Forbidden Science 4, he, share, he shares a record of his private study into unexplained phenomena between 1990 and basically the end of, of the millennium. And in an entry dated Thursday, March 26, 1992, um, Valet writes, I have secured a document confirming that the CIA simulated UFO abductions and encounters in Latin America, specifically Brazil and Argentina, as psychological warfare experiments. So if you think about that for a second, is it possible, and maybe another reason why the U.S. Air Force swooped in to, to collect everything, could this have been a some type of experiment done by the United States military on the Brazilian people that maybe just went went awry hmm. and that's interesting i i really do wrestle with the possibility that these beings that are being seen are actually we made them they're not extraterrestrial they're not some you know space alien but in fact they're they're art they're either some type of artificially programmed beings or they're you know we have the technology um or we've gathered dna from maybe a a natural being from a prior crash or something like that we've been able to clone or create some sort of of being artificially in a lab and we're using them in order to conduct these experiments while also disseminating this alien ufo idea across the world and really the united states military is making everybody believe what they want them to believe as as a part of their experiment which is very interesting because in the cia's own documents and now this we don't have proof of the actual document about the CIA simulating the UFO abductions and encounters in Latin America. He said that that was given to him by somebody very reputable, but it's uh, under embargo right now. But there is a document in the CIA's archives um, that was from the early 1950s where the CIA director actually asked how to use the UFO phenomenon in connection with U.S. psychological warfare efforts. So if you think about that, I don't think it's totally out of the realm of possibility that the United States is using UFOs in the way that we know them and aliens in the way that we know them in order to disseminate information and sort of the story of alien and UFOs in the way that they want us to know it because maybe the real reality is far different and far more mm. potentially sinister or serious than they want us to believe. So in fact, they keep this story of like the little big-eyed aliens and their flying saucers kind of in our minds at all times to distract us from the real reality. Thinking back to, you know, psyops and aliens, I think we were discussing in the uh the East Palestine train derailment whether or not the the re the recent spate of UFO sightings were in fact actually like right. a false flag or like Absolutely. A, a psyop, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I I I tend to believe that that does happen. That mm -hmm. they use these things to distract you from bigger, more serious things that are happening. It seems to be a pretty common belief among people, too. Well, yeah. I mean, we know for a fact that they've mm -hmm. done false flag. Oh, for sure. You know, but, attacks events over the years. So, but it seems it like surprise me. more often people are questioning most, you know, recent events, wondering if, you know, it's all a facade in a way. Yeah. I think that's the hardest thing about the whole UFO phenomenon is like mm -hmm. what what part of it is real and what's not. And I think the only thing that we know to be absolutely real is that we are seeing in all of the governments and countries of the world, this is like a an earth problem at this point. We're all capturing evidence, pictures, video. We're having these unidentified flying objects interfere with nuclear systems and all sorts of other things across the entire world. And this has been going on since the very beginning of of modern civilization. So what is at the root of that? I don't know. And I don't know that it's necessarily space aliens from another galaxy or another planet. But in fact, what if there's another species that's already been on this planet far longer than we have, have existed? Think about that. Put that in your pipe and smoke it tonight. And consider the fact that maybe... <laughs> Prior to the last cataclysm here on Earth, you know, the Great Flood, we all talk about the Great Flood. Prior to that, there was an advanced civilization that figured out a way to survive it in order to, you know, mm -hmm. restart civilization. We are 
that restart. Yeah, maybe. And they're observing us from wherever they're staying. I tend to believe that they're potentially at the bottom of the ocean because we, we haven't explored Damn, that. Damn, we're getting off here, but yeah. Sorry, this is, this is where my mind goes, but. No, I love it. I think it's a real possibility. I think that it's possible. Yeah, it's certainly. not aliens. It's not little gray aliens with bug eyes that are coming. These are mm -hmm. maybe human beings. They're just, or they're some offshoot of ancestor yeah. of ours or right. something that are just far more advanced and intelligent than we are. Mm -hmm. Their technology, I mean, they have the ability to live at the bottom of the ocean. So their technology is going to be much better. And maybe that's what we're seeing in the skies. See, is in fact, them. That's mm. what gets me too is that aliens don't necessarily have to be you know, short grays or, you know, mm -hmm. right. big heads the and the big eyes, they could look startlingly like you mm -hmm. or I do. Like the Nordic yeah. idea. Yeah. Or are they just looking completely the same as us? There is no yeah. differences between them. They're walking among us. We don't even I mean, that would be the Maybe we are them, the right? aliens. Well, I've thought about that too. Like, could we have originated from some other galaxy? Panspermia. Some, yeah, exactly. Oh, now we're getting to panspermia. Somehow we show up. That is one of my favorite theories to talk about. I could go on and on, but we got to wrap up this episode. We're not a uh, native to this planet. But anyways, that is the <laughs> That's Varginia. a lot to put in your pipe and smoke tonight. Absolutely. You have a lot to smoke, folks. Mm -hmm. But that is the 1996 Virginia UFO incident. Let us know in the comments on YouTube if you're watching, if you believe in this UFO incident. I give us like the percentage. Hard, yeah, give us the percentage because the yes or no is really hard. Yeah, but. give us a percentage and let us know, you know, if you don't believe, what do you think happened? Mm -hmm. And then give us your, your thoughts on that little discussion at the end we mm -hmm. just had about aliens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we want to hear everything from you guys. But um, make sure you guys are subscribed on YouTube. We'd really appreciate it. It takes a second. It's completely free. It really does help us out. And make sure you're following us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. But yes. that is it for us today. That is us. That is for us today. <laughs> We'll see you guys next time. And until then, keep on taking your mind a mile higher.